I tend to, to love all my students. I mean, they're young and it's new to them and it's my really great joy to introduce them to the music that I love. And I know that there's going to be some way that I can find to get through even to the ones who've had no experience in what we call classical music or serious music. I'll find something that they like and I'll be able to find a piece that they like. Um, and once they like it, then there's so much we can do. There's so much I can get out of them in their own personal expressiveness. And, and um, I love to do that. What's difficult is a student who really doesn't want to be there, maybe. And there are the occasional ones. Uh, maybe they're there because mom wanted them to be a singer. And they really just, it's not right for them. And usually at Loyola, pretty soon we find a way to move them into something that they really do like and enjoy. Um, occasionally that doesn't happen. A student that that is difficult would be one who doesn't want to do their own work. A good student walks into my studio already with his or her own set of lights, you know, their own ideas, their own energy. Um, a lot of young students, uh, undergrads, just present themselves as if they're just saying, you know, do me, <laughs> do something for me. And I'll ask them, how are you? And they'll say, tired. <laughs> I told a student, of course they're tired, you know. I feel like saying, I'm tired, <laughs> you know, we're all tired. But don't be tired. If you're going to be doing music, let's just not go there. You know, I, I had a student a couple of weeks ago who said that, and I just sat her down. I said, you know, you're a junior now. It's time to stop telling me that you're tired. Just don't answer that way. You know, <laughs> my old teacher said to me, a singer is never tired, never coughs, and never cries. <laughs> that was Margaret Harshaw, and she was a battle axe. But, you know, I said, oh, okay. But, you know, it, it's true. There's a, you engage yourself. And I told this student, what, what we need to do is work on how do you access your energy? How do you find your sparkle so that I don't have to do it for you? I've been doing it in your lessons. You come in, you're like this. And by the end of the lesson, I've gotten you like this, you know? But I've had to do it for you. And uh, I'd like you to learn to do it. Um, and, you know, that's, that's a process too. Um, so those are the students. The students that already have their own energy have a way of being with themselves. Another difficulty with, with undergrads, especially if they're gifted, the really smart, gifted ones, have a low tolerance for frustration. When they don't get it, you know, they even go, Ugh! you know, they make that sound. And I, I say, you know, this is not going to get us there in singing. You need to learn to be patient because everything you do in serious music is a process that's going to take some time. You're not going to get it today or tomorrow. But if you work on it today and tomorrow and the next day, and by the end of the week, you'll have something. So teaching them about how to deal with their own frustrations, how to be patient with themselves, how to how to work a step-by-step -step plan. That's what I'm working on with some of my freshmen right now. Learning how to sing is incomparable. And um, that's why, you know, when sometimes people say, well, what are all these voice students at Loyola going to do? Are they all going to sing at the Met? You know, and, and you say, no. <laughs> but if what they desire is to learn how to be singers and to sing, it will not be time wasted. They will find a million ways. And they'll probably sing all their lives if they really love it. They'll sing in the church choir. They'll sing in the symphony chorus. The world always wants to hear singers who are good and who love to sing. You know, there's, there's always a place. 
It's not always paid, <laughs> but it's good when it is. <laughs> One of the things about about being an artist is that it doesn't all happen in the studio with me. That's just one hour a week. My students need to become self-starters and to learn what to do in the practice room. And that's something that has fascinated me. What do they do when they're alone? And usually I've gotten to where I almost have a crystal ball and I can tell them, you know, I can say, I, I guess that when you're alone in the practice room, you, and complete this sentence, you know, you, some of the things they do is some of them stare at the music the whole time instead of making themselves get away from the music and, and memorize it and sing it from their heart. And I can tell the ones that do that, you know, and I have to teach them what it is to memorize. Sometimes they just need techniques, sometimes they just need me to keep telling them. Um, or I'll say, you know, in the practice room, you just get in there and you, you just want to sing, sing, sing. And there's a lot more to being a singer of serious music than that. You have to spend a certain amount of time at the piano figuring out what the other person is doing while you're singing. What does, what does that piano part sound like? Even if you have not much piano skill, you can look at it and figure it out and, and predict what you're going to hear or you you know you can figure out what your entrances are or you need to sit down with a poem and just speak the poem speak it in your own words figure out who's doing what to whom in this poem what's happening here so that it can become your own and it's in the practice room that they learn to do that and um, I it is, again, one of my joys to see a student begin to love practicing, to love that alone time with the music and themselves at the piano or just, just sitting there with the music, just thinking about the poetry. You know, if I can do that for a student, that, you know, makes my life worthwhile. I mean, I, I, uh, I want them to be excited about it. I think it's important. I, I know um, at the very advanced level there are certainly many teachers in New York and, and the big centers from whom you hear almost nothing but encouragement. If, if my students, who, I mean nothing but criticism and very little encouragement if my students are telling the truth who come back from there. Um, they're partly because the, the level is getting higher and the standard is getting higher um, and also those teachers don't have to uh, extend themselves to find a way to encourage. I think uh, teachers of very advanced people know that the student wants it and know that the student is motivated and they don't have to work with that side of the student. At the undergraduate level you're dealing with people who love to sing, love music, but need encouragement. And um, what's fun is to find something that is true to encourage them with. I think that's really, really important. Not just to say a general, hey, great, you're doing great. You know, but I, I had a friend when I was a student myself who is still singing, Catherine Boulin, now singing as Catherine Day. She's a, she was my colleague at, at the Curtis Institute of Music. We both studied with Margaret Harshaw. And I admired Catherine because she was always positive. She'd always find something to say to you when you'd perform together that was positive and also true. She, she had a gift for that. You'd know she was telling you the truth. You'd know that she had watched you closely enough to find that thing that you do well and she found a way to articulate it to you. It was just admirable. At that age, I wasn't mature enough, I think, to do that, but I certainly saw it in her and it was inspiring. And um, with my students, that's what I want to do too. I also want to find the place where they are insecure and find a way to encourage them through that place. To find a way to criticize a student um, you know, 
know, you say it needs to be constructive, it needs to be this, it needs to be that. If I can tell them a story about myself, that I had the same thing, or that I went through it too, uh, or if I can, can dig into that place where they know perfectly well that they need, they need to work and they need more. And I can just let them know that I know. You know, we're in this together. I'm, I'm not here to judge you. I'm, I'm here to be a guide through this journey that you're making to, uh, to be a better singer. And I recognize, just like you do, what the difficulty is. Or get them to articulate it. You know, sometimes that's the best. Say, how did that feel to you? What, what was, and they'll go, uh, you know, and I'll say, why are you going, uh, what is it? And then they can articulate it. And then I can say, okay, let's look at that and look at what we can do about it. You know, this, these are things that every teacher, one-on-one -on -one teacher learns to do if you, if you care about it in that way. You know, you, you figure out what, what's going to work and what doesn't. A student who feels judged and feels criticized to a certain point can't sing anymore. So what would be my point in beating them down with criticism to prove my own authority or something? I then wouldn't get results. You know, I want results. I want them to sing better. The body's the instrument from the top of your head to your toes. And um, of course we encourage our students to, to go work out and to be fit. You're very glad of a student who has some fitness. Um, and you refer to it. You know, one of the things you want to find out is have you done any sports? And then you refer maybe to certain aspects of that sport um, or you ask them to tell you about it. A lot of times kids who've been in team sports have had the experience of being under a coach and coaches are mean and, and yet they get, they get it out of you. A lot of times those kids are very disciplined and, and they know what's involved in, in being in a physical activity. But I have a yoga mat in my studio and I get the girls on the floor doing sit-ups and leg lifts. Um, in order to access the, the core areas of the body, as Pilates calls it, you know, all the core of the body is where we sing from, glutes, abs, lower back. Um, and we, we work very physically. Sometimes I'll have them put their fingers on the piano like a ballet dancer and, and do a plie. As the notes go up, their body goes down into the plie, so they have that basic Italian sense of the higher the notes, the lower the energy in the body. That's the, a very basic rule of singing. The, the lower the notes, the higher the energy in the body. It's more chesty. And the, but the higher the notes, we, you know, we get into really the low, low energy. And um, so, so, you know, it's a, it's a reason why generally in the, in the studio, I, I wouldn't wear what I'm wearing right now. I wear, you know, a pair of pants and, and something that looks a little bit casual, comfortable shoes. Sometimes we kick our shoes off and, uh, you know, it's a very physical activity. But you do, when you've seen hundreds of students, you do begin to see patterns uh, among the young ones and, and uh, certainly teaching the physicality and connecting it then with the emotions you asked about. The emotions reside really in the area um, of what people call gut feelings, and there's a reason they call it gut feelings because we, we have our, our deepest feelings here in the, in, in the abs, in the stomach, and that's why people in, in great pain or, or grief will often hold their stomach and rock. You see that activity because of the because the sadness is, is so strong there and they're holding it, holding on to it just in order to hold on, to not fall apart. Um, 
you know, I'll just show my students that, uh, that laughter and, and sobbing, <laughs> as, as, as you've seen in lessons, <laughs> come from the same place where the deep <laughs> chortle <laughs> also, also can tip over <laughs> into a, where the <laughs> sobbing comes from. I, I'm a medium easy crier. I always have Kleenex in my studio and sometimes my students sing in a way that moves me to tears and you know I will let them see that most of the time if I if I don't think it's gonna get in the way I'll let them see that my I've teared up and I you know I'll just say you know you you got me <laughs> you I'm all messed up because of what you just did and and uh, and tell them what it is and sometimes the pianist will be crying too if it's one of those, those moments, you know, when a young person gets it and, and is, is giving you from, their, from themselves that, that beauty in their soul and voice. It's just immensely moving and I'm, I'm moved by it. And uh, to share the depth of your humanity with someone else through the medium of art, it's just... You know, I'm getting myself right now. It really, it's what's important. And it's the spirit of God, you know. And then, then you're connected to that student in that way. They can see that they can move Mrs. Fronemeyer, which if they only knew how easy it is. <laughs> but, you know, they can, move, they can move me with what they do. And, uh, and, and that those who love music are ready to be moved. It's what we most want. I think some students think that it is a veneer. They think, okay, technique is over here and expression is over here and, and we'll work on the technique first and then we'll add the expression. I, I don't find that that is the best way. Um, I think the the response either to the music or the poetry that, that a student has or that they see in me um, is what gives them the energy to do the technical thing, gives them the desire to do it. You know, if, if there's something difficult like a, like a little floating high note or a big powerful high note, we have to dig into why the composer wrote that high note there. What, what did he want? You know, if, if when in the extremes of the voice, the composer wanted an extreme of emotion of some kind. And so um, as we search for that and help a student find it, um, that student then finds the energy or the desire to do the technical thing they need to do which is an integrating thing. You know, technique in singing is not pushing this button, pushing this button, lowering this, lifting that, turning this, deepening that, but it's all at once-ness, you know. You, you just have to have a gestalt, and, um, and the emotion can get you to that gestalt. Then once a student has experienced it, they can go back and find it. Then we can sometimes take it apart and say, okay, did you notice? that when you sang that fabulous high C, you know, that your, your, your lower body was really engaged. And sometimes they'll say, yeah, I almost felt like I was gripping the ground with my toes. And I'll say, yes, 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 that's what we feel. Or did you, did you notice how alive your face was? Because you can't really sing a high note with a face that's dead. You know, the, the face has to be vital, especially in la mascara, as the Italians call it, around the eyes, um, so that that whole area of vibration is, is open and available. And so, uh, so, you know, when a student starts to notice what it is they did, then they, then they want to reproduce it. Um, often, they want to reproduce it mechanically. And you know, they say, okay, I'll just do this, and I'll do this, and then I'll get that high note again. And they don't, because the key was will, being, the, being willing to step into that emotion. And that's the scary place, you know, that's the place that takes the risk and the energy to, to share your emotion. 
Yeah, it's an area of frustration with American students because uh, languages are, are not emphasized in secondary education and primary education in the way that I wish that they were. You know, a child of six can learn a language so easily and a student of, of 18 or 19 has, has lost the, the, the flexibility of the brain to be able to do that in the same way. Of course, by the time you're 45 or 50, you know, it's even harder. That language area of the brain somehow is at its most uh, optimum at the, when, a, when a child is very young. And um, it's just sad that, that our nation doesn't put the emphasis on learning languages. But that's a whole topic to itself. And, and uh, so we generally get students who, for whom English is their only language. Maybe they've had some years of Spanish, or they've had uh, you know, a little bit of a smattering of this or that language. And whatever they've had, I try to build on that. Um, I, the language that I learned was German because I sang in Germany for some time, so, so I was working in that language. So with German, I feel very, very competent. Um, I had French from earliest childhood, so French I feel also very, very good with. My uh, professor at the Curtis Institute was um, Tom Grubb, who was a student of Pierre Bernac, who was the, the great teacher of, of French melody and the pronunciation of French and so on. So I really had a wonderful pedigree there. Uh, with Italian, I do the best I can. I had marvelous professors. I lived in Italy for maybe two months, not enough to really feel like I was authoritative in that language. But I have enough knowledge to get an undergraduate started and, uh, and to know what the typical things, the typical mistakes Americans make and to correct those. Um, we, we encourage students to take foreign languages in class, but of course we all know that that really doesn't do it. You know, you have to go to the country and be there. And so any chance our students have to take advantage of Loyola's programs abroad, I try to push them into it. It's tough for music students because they have so many requirements that are sequential that to take a semester throws their whole time at Loyola off to take a semester abroad. So it is very tough. If they can get there in the summer, wonderful, you know, if, if there's some program. But of course that, you know, to go to the country, to be, hear it spoken, to be around it, that's just, there's nothing like that. There's nothing to compare. But what we do is we do teach diction in the music department here. Across campus in the language department, they teach, you know, the grammar, vocabulary. And the diction classes that we teach have to do with singing repertoire. So a diction class, uh, there's always an accompanist there, and they sing and we show them how to sing in such a way that it sounds like you speak the language. <laughs> you know, that's what we need to do. We need to learn to sing German Lieder and sound as though you are a German, or at least that you've been around Germans. And you know the things that they do, the things that they tend to do when they interpret this music. This is a whole area to itself. You sing French music and you want to learn the style that a Frenchman would use singing it. Um, and they, these, are, you know, these are huge cultures that people spend lifetimes studying. We can just scratch the surface here, but we want to give our students a good enough introduction that if they decide to go on to grad school, if they decide to go into singing, at least they've had some basics. They won't make horrible glaring errors when they, when they audition for someone. They won't look ignorant. And I'll just say that to them, you know, I'll say, if you pronounce it that way in an audition, somebody's just gonna cross you off the list because they'll say, this is an ignorant kid who has no skill in languages. Don't let them say that about you, you know, at least get the basic things right so that they go, oh, well, she's had some training. You know, at least, at least they can say that. Usually at Loyola we have 
three scholarship auditions um, where students come in and we, you know, then we decide if we're going to give them scholarship money and how much. Um, there are certain simple basics, again, you know, if I were talking to a student and saying, this is how to make a good impression. Walk in and, and be glad to be there, you know. Even though your heart may be pounding, <laughs> smile. Um, even come up to the people and shake their hands. Introduce yourself, be friendly. Um, no matter how you're, you're shaking in your knees or your shoes, they won't see that. You know, you think it's so obvious that you're, you know, and that your voice is shaking. People never notice that. If you're friendly and you look them in the eye and you shake their hand and say, I'm so-and-so, you know, you've already halfway won the battle. And then make sure that you stand in the crook of the piano. Uh, don't, don't sort of stand on the side of the piano or way out in front, but, but take your place in that little curve of the piano. That's, that's where a singer belongs to be, so that's, that's where you go. And you've, you've brought legible music for the accompanist. You want to be sure to do that, preferably a very clear Xerox or original music. Not something that won't stay open, but something that lies well on the piano. All these little things. If you're going to take a breath or take time somewhere, you've marked it clearly in the music. You know, you go and put that music in front of the accompanist. You also shake hands with the accompanist and smile at them. You know, all these things that seem so obvious, but they're not. Um, so often we have to say to a student, now, do you have your music? Or, you know, stand in the crook of the piano. Um, and um, know your music by memory. Have performed it a lot, as much as you can before you come. We at Loyola like to hear uh, one song in a foreign language and one song in English. And if you, um, if you have some way to get someone to help you, you learn one of the basic Italian songs, a German song, a French song, um, and you can get people to advise you on that. And then something in English, which could be something from musical comedy, um, not too much of a jazz song. Most of our pianists don't uh, play from a fake book, but, uh, but something that is written out uh, is best. And uh, we look for uh, a student who, who stands up straight, seems to enjoy the music, seems to understand what they're singing about, has a certain ability to breathe well, and um, has a little bit of training under their belt. You know, nowadays we get a quality of student that, that has already had some voice or at least has been in choirs and has a sense of what, what it is to, to perform for people. So, um, and then usually after the audition, this is good to know, we ask them if they have any questions about Loyola. So, you know, think up some nice question. <laughs> you know, say, tell me about your choral program or, you know, how much performance opportunity is there, or something like that, you know, something that looks like you have thought about <laughs> what, uh, what Loyola is going to give you. And um, those are the people that, that we're very happy to see walk through the door, and, and we hope they come to Loyola. I do teach memorization. It's another one of my favorite things to teach um, because undergraduates need it. And because, again, I think it's something neglected in, in secondary school. You know, it used to be in the days of our grandparents or our parents that young people memorized a lot. My parents, who are in their 80s, know a lot of poems by heart. Great, you know, poet, English poetry, American poetry, you know, Longfellow and Whittier and, and Shakespeare. They can recite. Shakespeare sonnets, they can re recite Hiawatha, they can recite huge chunks of, of, of poetry. And what a joy to have that for the rest of your life. You know, in Sunday schools they used to memorize a lot of Bible verses. Nothing wrong with that either, you know, that's some of the great language of our culture. Um, it isn't true anymore, you know. Schools just don't make kids memorize anymore. Most of my students, I ask them, have you ever memorized any poems? No. 
you know, so they don't, they don't have that background. What I'll say to my students about memorizing, I'll give them various things I want them to do. I want them to recite the poem to me, uh, just as a poem, without the music. It's tremendously helpful. Um, I'll tell them to write it out, sit down and write it down, write it out three times looking at it and then see if how much of it you can write out without looking at it. You know, these kinds of simple things. Make flashcards. Um, I will, as when it comes to the, uh, to the notes and the rhythms, uh, I will have my students speak the words while beating time in the conducting pattern so that they get the, the text together with the rhythm before they put the notes on it. I mean, basically, when we have a song, we have, we have notes, we have rhythm, we have text, and we have the accompaniment, those four strands. And uh, when you have a big task, it's good to break it down into smaller tasks. So memorizing the poem, just as a poem, memorizing the rhythm along with the text is, is another way to do. Uh, singing the tune just on Lu 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 and, and working that for a while. Um, look, sitting down and looking at the accompaniment and making some, drawing some conclusions about, about that is another way. So that memorizing comes out of having looked at every aspect that's there. There are also markings. Now in Mozart there are very few. He'll put piano here, he'll put forte there. That's it, you know, there's nothing else. But if you get to Massenet, on one page there might be 21 different markings. Tenuti here and a ritardando there, a little marking there, a, um, you know, several different markings in French, um, just a huge number, as though Massenet wanted to come back from beyond the grave and tell us exactly how he wants his music done. Accent this, diminuendo here, crescendo there, sforzando there. You know, so you need to memorize all of those markings too. That's, that's part of what the composer gave you. And if you do every marking, people will say, oh, she's so musical. <laughs> And all you did was every single thing Massenet told you to do. What actors all say is acting is listening. And sure, we have, at the moment when we have to sing and express, it's all on us and we have to do our job. But there are long moments when someone else is singing. And it helps the audience so much if we are listening to what they're saying and reacting moment by moment to what they're giving us. Sometimes the other singer isn't even looking at you. They're sending their voice out into the, into the hall and they have to, you know, we all cheat out, as we call it, so that your voice will get over the orchestra. You can't sing into the wings uh, because your voice is lost. So, so you pretend that that person is looking at you and you look at them as though they, you're looking into their eyes, you know, um, and, and you, or you, turn in such a way that your back is to the audience and they can sing to you and then also out to the audience. You learn as a good colleague to do that on the opera stage, you know, that, that you, you make sure that, that you don't upstage them. Um, in opera, this is all important because that orchestra is loud and getting your voice through and across that orchestra is everything. And you want to Respect the fact that your colleague wants to do that too. But at the moment when it's your time to sing, you maneuver yourself in such a way that you can get your voice out, but still look as though you're talking to the person next to you. You know, we don't always stare each other in the eye when we're, we're talking to each other. We're, we're thinking about something, we look off into the distance, we're, we're talking, we're remembering, we're, you know, and that doesn't mean I'm not talking to you still. And so we use that on the opera stage, that aspect, to, to make sure that the audience gets our voice and also our facial expressions. You know, so it's, it's a trick in opera. Um, acting is a little different in opera than it would be on TV or even on the, on the stage. You have to learn how to, get, how to get it all out to the audience. Um, there was a professor I had at, at the Curtis Institute who did a wonderful exercise. She had us all wear masks 
and then you had to move around the stage, but the mask always had to be totally flat visible to the audience. So if you turn this way, your head still had to be, you know, your head, your head had to stay there even as you turned from side to side. It was hard to learn, but if you watched the other kids doing it, you could see the moment that they turned their head aside and you lost that, that, that flat mask. And so that taught you the skill of what we have to do on the opera stage. Um, they do look at our faces. They look at the expression of our eyes. You think they can't see you from that far back. Well, they've got their opera glasses out and they're looking, you know, they want to see what you're feeling as well as hear it. The parents usually are somewhat resigned by college age. They, they've been through this already. If the child has gotten to the point where they want to go to the Loyola University College of Music, they've been doing music for a while. And, and so the parents have, have uh, found a way to deal with it. Um, but parents do ask us, you know, they say, what, uh, what can I expect? For my child. Um, and of course they all have the hope that this will be the child who's, who's the next Renee Fleming, the next great, great tenor or soprano or whatever. And sometimes they are once in a great while. Um, we've had some, some marvelous students who are out performing in the, on the big stages of the world. But, uh, but it's rare. And college is the place to explore. Now, if you come to the College of Music, of course, you're committed to a lot of music courses and a lot of music study and, and recitals and, you know, uh, or if it's music therapy or, or music industry, you know, it's, it's, it's a great deal of study of your field. But those who come to us in, in the field of performance, um, we, we tell parents that this will be of infinite value to their, to their child, no matter what their child decides to do after school. Some of them go to grad school in performance and become teachers or um, take over church ministries, um, go into choral conducting, teach. We have, we have teachers all over the city and in fact all over the state who are wonderful music teachers who began as performers with us. What we say is just, you know, Loyola will give your, your child a chance to explore the area of music and themselves as much as any place I know of. And we will, we will pour out heart and soul in the studio to this student, bringing them musically and with their voice as far as they care to go and as far as they can go. There are lots of auditions here. They may get to audition for summer programs during their years at Loyola. And we have several now at Opera in the Ozarks, several at uh, Ohio Light Opera. We have one at Brevard Festival. We have, there are lots of summer opera festivals for young people that, uh, that give them a, a toe into what it's like to be in the profession and, um, and to see that. Um, and we, we try to facilitate that for them so that they can get experiences like that too. Um, but what they do with it is, is their business and uh, we, just, we just respect and honor every parent who entrusts us with their child for the duration and, uh, and, and we'll do our best. You know.